Welcome to the Southwest Affiliate Stroke Boot Camp Series. We are excited to offer this 15-week course as a way to educate the stroke coordinators in key components of their role, provide tools and resources to build and maintain successful programs, and to assist in building a large network of peers. Before we get started, we would like to go over just a few housekeeping items. To avoid background noise, all lines have been placed on mute. For any questions, you can unmute your line by pressing star six, or you can type in the Q&A section of WebEx. Please note, you will only be able to claim your CME, CE credit at the end of the 15-week series on September 27th. A copy of today's slides and any handouts will be sent to you within a week of today's call. For future webinar offerings, including the Stroke Bootcamp webinars, please visit www.heart.com dot org forward slash SWA quality. Now we will begin today's webinar. Colleen Kerr is AVP of Neurolo Neurological Clinic Clinical Services of the Gulf Coast Division of HCA. Colleen obtained her BSN from the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston and her MBA from the University of Phoenix. She is currently completing her MSN at the Western Governors University. She has held a variety of leadership roles in nursing, education, and quality. Outside of work, Colleen enjoys time with her husband, Wayne, and her daughter, Kelly, who are both nurses. She enjoys crafts and home improvement projects with Kelly and traveling with Wayne. I'll pass it over to you, Colleen. Okay, thanks, and welcome, everybody. So we're going to be talking about your surveys coming up. How do you get ready for it? And hopefully, okay, a little technologically difficult. Okay, why is it not? Okay, I have nothing to disclose. So it takes a village. You guys are the stroke coordinators, but it takes an entire team to have a great stroke program. You are the leader. You're sharing the information, you're letting them know what the standards and expectations are, but they all have to get aboard and contribute to your success of the program. So it takes a village. So for Joint Commission, you know every two years you're going to have your stroke survey, and they open up a window, and you, in that 90 days, you know that sometime you will be, have your survey, and they do give you a seven days advance notice. If you're with DMV, you have an annual survey, and it's usually, if they surveyed you in September of this year, you know that next year you're going to be surveyed in September. So you pretty much know when your survey is coming. And I actually like being surveyed every year because you can't get behind. You know it's coming. They aren't current. So one of the most frequent citations by Joint Commission is not having a clinical practice guideline as the foundation of your stroke program. So you're all required to have a clinical practice guideline that is current and relevant. And many use the American Stroke Association CBGs. So if you, even if you're a primary stroke center, you are required, but you keep your intracranial hemorrhages and subarachnoid hemorrhages because you have those services, then you need to have a CBG for each of them. And while we're on the subject, why don't we do the polling questions so we'll know, um, are you a primary stroke center? Are you a thrombolytic capable stroke center? Because there's Joint Commission started in this year. Or are you comprehensive stroke? So let's see what our audience is, because most of this lecture is really geared at primary stroke centers. Hi, Colleen. It's Deanna. So um, out of the 88 that participated, 40 are from proke stroke, 3 are from thrombolytic, thrombotic means. <laughs> And uh, seven are comprehensive. Oh, great. Okay. So it doesn't matter what type of program you have. You'll need to have clinical practice guidelines that are guiding your program, guiding your order sets, guiding your policies. 
and American Stroke Association has all different types of CPGs for the different types of programs. One of the things they talk about is that you must have, uh, your staff must have access to these clinical practice guidelines. So a lot of hospitals put links on their intranet page so the staff can go to the intranet page and link into the CPGs. And then like this year, the American Associate, uh, Stroke Association uh, updated and released the 2018 stroke guidelines, and so the staff needs to be educated on these CPGs. What's new this year? So I always encourage that you start creating binders with all the documents you're going to be needing for your survey. Um, keep it organized. Have a tab for each different sections, and you can do this weeks out, or you can actually have your survey and then just keep updating your binders throughout the next year or two years. So what do you need to have in your binders? Well, obviously an organizational chart, because that's one of their requirements. Put a little sticky tab on, because this is something that changes frequently in most hospitals, so you would want a week or two before your stroke survey to get the latest and greatest organizations chart. Your stroke policies, have they been updated? Most times all policies have to be reviewed and revised every three years as needed. Does the staff know about the policies, where they're located? Does your policy reflect your practice? And that's a common finding that the survey will say your policy says X, but the practice is why. So make sure your policy reflects your practice. And then make sure they've been reviewed and updated as required. You need to have a job description for your stroke medical director, and it must be signed. And the stroke medical director is required to have eight hours of education every year, not just the year you're having the survey, but each year. Core stroke team, that's how you at your organization define the core stroke team. It can be two people, it can be the stroke medical director and the stroke coordinator, or you can add a lot of other people. But I advise you to keep it small because everybody that is on that core stroke team has to have eight hours of continuing education or eight hours of equivalent educational activity. What outreach have you done? So EMS outreach, you're required to have two per year. So that's why you want to keep your binder update updated because a year from now, you might think, now what did I do last year? So if you're just updating your binder as you your program rolls along, it will always be ready to go. Again, community outreach, two per year. So if you worked with your marketing department and developed a flyer or a uh, education brochure that went to homes, it was a mail out, you want to keep one of those in your binder to show here's what we sent out to this zip code. Do you have hold messages on your telephone or do you have telephone uh, television screens in your hospital that talks about fast? If your outreach was a presentation, you went to a church group, women's group, and you talked about signs and symptoms of stroke, risk factors for stroke, you'll need to do an evaluation by the participants to show did they learn from your presentation. Outreach can be going to a health fair and handing out information about FAST or what most people are doing nowadays is be fast or how do you reduce your risk for a stroke. And then patient education. So some hospitals have a patient handbook that every patient in the hospital receives. And what I've seen is that stroke has a page in that book. And so they may talk about be fast, and then on the back side it may be here are risk factors for strokes and you can reduce by doing X, Y, and Z. So you want to put that in your book. Your stroke order sets need to be reviewed and revised well, not always revised, but at least reviewed annually. So you want to look at your stroke order set and compare it to your CPG, especially if that CPG has changed in the last year. Um, even if you are a comprehensive stroke center, you still need to have a transfer agreement 
for a higher level of care or if, or if you're a comprehensive stroke center, another comprehensive stroke center, because you never know when there's going to be a day that you need to transfer a patient. Maybe you've had an internal disaster and you no longer can accept patients, or your physician is occupied in the OR and you do not have a backup physician, and so that patient will need to be transferred. So you always have to have a transfer agreement. Your stroke committee minute. You need to have at least two meetings a year and look through your minutes. If you have identified issues in one meeting, did you come back the next meeting and close that loop? And maybe it takes several meetings before you're actually able to resolve that issue, but they're going to look to see if you've closed the loop on issues. The other important thing is, is your stroke medical director attending the stroke committee meetings? They should be. And then what education do you provide to the staff? All hospital staff should be educated on FAST or BFAST so that the housekeeper who walks into a patient's room and they're having a stroke or a visitor who's having a stroke, they'll know what to do. So at the very minimum, everybody in the hospital should have that type of education. And then what do you require your ED to have or your ICU? There's minimum set in your standards, but you can always go above that, and many hospitals do. And then you want to keep your patient list because if you're having a joint commission survey, they're going to want to look back for two years. Now, most of the time, they only take patients the past couple of months, but they can go all the way back and look at patients two years ago. You're required to have quality improvement projects two projects a year. Now, if you were unable to resolve one of your projects and bring it to closure, that can continue the next year. And then what type of patient satisfaction follow-up do you do with your patients? Are you calling your patients a week or two weeks post-discharge? Are you asking them open-ended questions? Tell me about the medications that you're on. Have you been able to obtain your medication? What doctor's appointments have you made? What were your stroke risk factors? What are you doing to re reduce that risk factors? Open-ended questions. The morning of the survey, your mother-in-law is coming to visit. You want to do the white glove, make sure that everything looks great. Pull a current patient list to make sure that anybody who came in overnight, you're going to look at the chart and make sure it looks good, that all the documentation's there, NIH has been done, we started patient education, walk through the departments, follow the path that the surveyor is going to take to make sure everything looks good. We usually set aside one room that we will bring all our materials in We'll start the conference in the morning there, and then during the day when the stroke surveyor comes back and wants to meet with education department, the quality department, medical staff, we always have that meeting in that room. So it usually it's set up for the whole day. Opening conference. You're not required to create a PowerPoint, but I would say most organizations do. You want to brag about your hospital and about your stroke program. You want to give them information about the hospital. Who's your administrative team? The organization chart. The history and demographics of the hospital. You know, we just opened four years ago. We started with 20 beds. We're now up to 59 hospital beds. How many physicians are on staff, your employees? What's your annual ED visits, your admission? So you want to give them a good idea of the type of hospital and the type of patients you see. What is the mission statement of the hospital? What's your primary and secondary service areas? And anything special about those service areas? We serve a huge um, 
population of Hispanic, Spanish-speaking patients, and here's some things we've done to meet their needs. Greg, any kind of certifications, awards, or recognitions that you've re the hospital has received, you want to highlight that in the opening conference. Then you want to talk about your stroke program. What is the mission of your stroke program? Introduce your team. What is your stroke volume? And it, you need to at least provide two years, but if you've been growing your stroke program year after year, show that growth. Five years ago, here's where we are, and each year we've grown in our volume. Who are your EMS providers? Some hospitals only have one EMS provider. At a hospital I was previously at, we had 14 different EMS providers that brought patients to us. So you want to give them a lay of the land and how you collaborate with those EMS providers. What type of outreach and education are you doing with them? Your collaboration with your ED, because that's so important. Your door to needle really depends on that strong relationship with the ED providers and the ED nurses. What type of community outreach are you doing? Are you doing health fairs? Have you gone in and talked to civic groups? I know of one hospital that started doing outreach, stroke education, to grade school because of many of those students were being cared for after hours by grandparents. And they had a great success story to share with the surveyor. A nine-year-old had received a stroke education, fast education during school, and his grandfather had a stroke. And he asked his grandfather to smile, hold up his arm, speak. He called 911, let his them know that his grandfather was having a stroke. What a great success story to share with your surveyor. So any stories like that, share with your stroke surveyor at the beginning of the conference. Do you have a stroke support group? You're not required to have one, but if you have one, highlight it. Anything special you do about your program. If you got an award from Get With the Guidelines, you want to make sure that they know that you got that award. Tracer methodology is how most of the surveyors do start out their survey, and they're going to trace the path that a stroke patient is going to experience. And for most of our stroke patients, it starts in the emergency room. So they're going to go to the emergency room and first ask, okay, and they want to talk to staff. They know that directors and managers have all the answers. So they talk to the staff. And so they're going to pick a staff. Tell me about EMS. How do they notify you that a patient's coming in? What do you do with that information? What happens when they actually appear on the scene? Where do they bring the patient in? What happens next? And they will ask. They'll ask the physician, what do you do? How do you handle this? Do you make a decision to give out a place, or do you call the neurologist? Do you use teleneurology? ED providers can make a decision to give out to place without consulting a neurologist, and many across the country are doing that. Some use teleneurology. Then they're going to say, okay, now show me where a patient walks in. Who's the person who first greets that patient? Is it a secretary, a receptionist? Do they use a kiosk? How do you recognize and what training have you received to recognize that somebody may be having a stroke? What do you do? How do you prioritize and get that patient seen immediately? If it's a very busy ED and there's a large waiting room, how are patients monitored while they're waiting to make sure that they're not deteriorating? or their stroke is not progressing. Then they're going to, obviously most of our patients go to CT scan, and they will ask, does, do you take them off the EMS stretcher or do you take them on the stretcher to CT? And then they'll walk to CT, want to talk to the CT techs, 
They'll ask, what is your role when you hear a code neuro, code stroke, code brain, whatever your terminology in the hospital is, what do you do? I get the the CT tables cleared. I I go to the ED to help them bring the patient to the CT scanner. And then they'll walk back to the ED to where now, where does the patient go? And what is the next step? Um, They will, one thing they have asked is, do you routinely put Foley's in drilling catheters in patients? And I would say most of us have gone away from that. What is your criteria to put in an indwelling catheter? Who mixes your alteplase? And they sent out a notice, Joint Commission did a year or so ago, about not using the word TPA. But if you're old like me, it just pops out. So we'll personally be calling it alteplase or activase instead of TPA. So they'll want to know who mixes the alteplase. And in many facilities, it is nursing. And so if nursing is mixing the alteplase, then they'll want to know, show me the training. How do you know this nurse is competent? What training did this nurse receive? Show me the competency. How often do you do competency? If you're a large organization and you're giving alteplase quite a bit versus a place that only gives it once or twice a month, Obviously, their sites may want to do competency verification more often. Um, They will ask the nurse, what is the blood pressure parameters? And this is a little bit of a trick question because to give out to place, the blood pressure has to be 185 over 110, and then afterwards it needs to be 180. And unfortunately, sometimes nurses will say it's 180 because that's what we've drilled into them, keep that blood pressure below 180. But just rehearse with them to give out to places 185. What is, how long is the bolus? Is it over a minute, two minutes? It should be over one minute. So those are little things that you can prep the staff ahead of time to make sure they know the answers. They do know the answers, but when the surveyor is in front of their face, suddenly it's like, oh my gosh, I forgot what the answer is. So just do practice drills with the staff so they feel comfortable. And with both surveys, you know at least seven days out what date your survey is, who your staff's on, so that you can prep them. So after they finish with the ED, they will um, go to the ICU because that's where most of our patients who receive out place go. There are a few hospitals that send them directly to a stroke unit but I would say the majority go to the ICU. So they'll go up to the ICU unit, and then after the ICU unit, they will go to the stroke unit. Once they get up to the ICU or stroke unit, they're going to look to see, okay, you have a stroke patient today? Let me sit with that nurse. And the first thing they'll say is, give me a report on this patient. And then they'll start reviewing the chart with the nurse. They're going to want to see the dysphagia screen. And they look at the dysphagia screen, the time the patient passed the dysphagia screen, and then they'll go to the medication administration record to make sure that the patient did not receive an oral medication before the time they passed the dysphagia screen. And unfortunately, that's a a frequent finding. So ask the nurse, what's the patient's stroke risk factors? What have you started to educate the patient on? Show me that documentation. If the patient, and many of us have patients who prefer language is not English, they'll want to see the education. What are your resources? You, Ms. Patient speak Spanish. How did you educate that patient in Spanish? So did they use a language line, an interpreter? Did they document that in the medical record that they provided the education in Spanish using this interpreter? And it has to be individualized education to the patient's risk factors. So if they do not smoke, 
we should not be providing them information on smoking sensation. So it has to be individualized to that patient. So look at, show me your NIH. When you received report from the previous nurse, did you and that nurse go into the room together and do the neuroassessment together? Then they'll look at how often are you doing neuro checks on the patient, not a full NIH. Most hospitals do that every 12 hours, usually at change of shift. But they'll want to see how often did you assess that patient neurologically throughout the day. Show me the documentation of that. What is the discharge plan from this patient? Show me where physical therapy saw the patient, OT saw the patient, speech saw the patient. Do you know where this patient is going to be discharged? So they just sit with that nurse and they go through the chart. And the nurses get a little scared because they're not always sure how to find all this information. They know how to put it into the chart, but finding it electronically is not always the same. So, again, having somebody, an expert, with your electronic medical record to help them is fine. When they're in the unit and they're reviewing the chart, they may ask to speak. I would like to speak to the physical therapist or the occupational therapist speech. I notice that this patient has no insurance. Can I speak to the social worker or the case management? Show me their notes of how they're helping this patient obtain resources for care post-hospitalization. If pharmacy is involved, they'll often ask to speak to the pharmacist. That's more often in the ER, especially if pharmacy comes down to the ER to mix out to place, they'll ask to talk to the pharmacist. Dietitian, if this patient is having trouble swallowing, and they're on a modified diet, how do you work with speech therapy to ensure that the patient gets the proper diet? Um, they may ask to talk to the physician. They'll obviously want to talk to the stroke medical director, but on the unit they may um, speak to a physician on the unit about the stroke patient and how they uh, interact with the stroke team. So. It's a good thing to rehearse this, make sure all the key players are aware of what's going on and what their role is and how to address the surveyor. So that usually takes up the morning and then it's lunchtime. And then after lunch, usually the first thing they'll do is data. And so it can be just the quality and the stroke coordinator, or they can have the whole team. It's however you guys want to present your data to the surveyor. There's benchmark data, you know, your door to needle, your door to, and what are you doing to improve your door to needle? We're required to door to needle within 60 minutes, at least 50% of the time. If you're doing this well, say you're at 80%, are you looking to improve by going to 45 minutes? And many hospitals are trying to push the needle to 45 minutes. So if you're working on that, show her what, or him what you've done to improve your door to needle time, and now your new goal is 45 minutes. Your core measures, nobody is ever perfect on the core measures. So talk about how you, what you're doing to improve your core measures. Your two quality improvement, performance improvement projects talk about the uh, methodology that you use, how you de decided to make this your project. Say, for example, your data showed that in your audits that dysphagia was a problem. It's a problem in uh, our system right now because we just changed to a new dysphagia tool. So once you make that change, you'll always see your data go down initially till everybody becomes familiar with your new tool and, and 
understands where to find it and how to do it. So here's what we did. Here's our data. Then we put in this step. We did hospital-wide education, or we went to gray armbands that said patients NPO until they pass their dysphagia screen as a way, a visual reminder. Whatever you did to try to improve your metrics, and you're just continually showing you're working on it. We Here's our data. Here's the same step we took. We followed up for two months, didn't get to where we wanted to be, so this is our new intervention. We followed it for another two months. We did better, but we're still not where we want to be, so this is our next new step. And what you want to be is just be able to talk. They don't expect you to be perfect, but you're continually working to get to a higher performance. One of your projects could be we're a primary stroke center, but we're now starting to screen our patients for ELVO, emergent large vessel occlusions, patients who could be transferred to that comprehensive center to have a mechanical thrombectomy. And so here's this, we educated the ED physicians and the ED nurses. We put in um, CTA, CT perfusion software. We're working with this comprehensive center so that we have a smooth process of transferring those patients to them for intervention. And then you just want to keep on showing we're working on this day by day, trying to improve. Patient satisfaction. So some hospitals get caught because they're using press gaining. If you have a stroke unit that only has stroke patients, that's fine. But again, it really is just looking how, you know, did we manage the pain? Were they prepared to go home? But most hospitals, their stroke unit doesn't just have stroke patients. They have overflow patients because maybe this week your stroke volume is down and so you have two or three patients that are pneumonia patients, and then you've got a GI bleed. So the survey is going to say, well, that just wasn't stroke patients. So I come up with some type of patient satisfaction, patient follow-up. And it can be a survey at the end of discharge, or it can be a phone call several weeks later. And then, very important, how do you share your data, your performance improvement projects with your organization, with leadership, because eventually they want to see through your quality program that it's making it up to the board of directors. But they'll ask the staff nurses as they're rounding, especially in the ED, well, what is your door-to-needle time? What have you done to improve that door-to-needle time? So make sure that the nurses are aware of your performance and what you've done to improve. And especially if your performance is outstanding, you want them to be able to say, yeah, our door to needle is at 60 minutes, it's 86%. And so we're working on shortening that time and doing it in 45 minutes. So make sure the staff can brag about that and be proud of it. So you want to analyze your data, and this is where your quality manager is very, very important because you're not an expert in everything. So they can help you with your data, with making charts and graphs to show your data, and you want to look at trends over time. And for most organizations, it's not that we don't have an, enough data. We have too much data because with electronic medical records, reports can be created and run on multitude of things. So often we have data overload. So you have to decide what data are you looking at and what are you going to take action on? And how often do you report your data and to whom? If you're a stroke coordinator, I would strongly encourage you at your stroke committee meetings, make sure senior leadership comes 
the CNO, the CEO. And if they don't come, think with whoever you report to, create a report that goes to senior leadership so that they know how well your stroke program is doing. Because sometimes you're going to need to involve them. If you've got, say you're having problems with X, and you're not able to get the support that you need, sometimes you need to tap into the C-suite and get them to help you move that metric to the next level. Very important that we share our findings with the staff. I think that's one of the things I hear a lot from frontline staff is they never hear how well they're doing. They hear when they don't do something right. Oh, you didn't do that dysphagia screening. Or you didn't document that you used the language line when you provided education. So we, they might have done 50 things right, but we tell them about the one thing they didn't do right. So let's tell them about the 49 things they did do right and so that they do understand they are contributing to the success of this program. So what happens if it isn't a perfect program and nobody has a perfect program? And maybe you had an adverse outcome or a near miss. That's a great opportunity to sit down and do an intense review, or what I like to call the root cause analysis, to understand what happened and why it happened. Who was involved? Is it a system issue? Was it supplies or equipment that we didn't have? Was staffing an issue? Was it an educational issue or was it a compliance issue? I, in a previous life, was director of education and everything is an education issue. In reality, often it's a compliance issue. We need to relook at why this happened and what can we do to make sure that the Swiss cheese does not line up to allow an error to happen. And with technology, we can put in a lot of processes, hard stops, that makes it harder for the nurse to do the wrong thing. For example, with Alteplase, if you're using um, a Laris pump, their guard rail system can be programmed that for stroke Alteplase, the infusion is capped at 81 milligrams. So that would prevent a nurse from infusing more than 81 milligrams for a patient. So look at technology. What can you do to make it easy for the nurse to do the right thing? And if you've had an error or a near miss, go out to the literature. Find out how others address this issue. If you're part of a larger organization, reach out to your other stroke coordinators in other hospitals to find out how they solve the problem. Often we think, oh, my gosh, we're the only person that's ever had this problem. And when you go out and do a lit review, you find out, oh, no, you're not. A lot of other people have had the same issue happen. So use their wisdom. You don't always have to reinvent the wheel. You can look at how they fix the problem and see if you can fix it the same way in your hospital. And when your surveyor comes and they find this issue, you can say, yes, and we recognized it, here's what we did, here's all the steps that we took to correct this issue, and here's the follow-up that we did to make sure that issue is correct. I've even seen them do it on an individual nurse level. So a nurse did not complete the alteplase monitoring form. They didn't do vital signs every 15 minutes like they were supposed to for the first two hours. So they had documentation where they had sat down with that individual nurse, provided education to that nurse about what the requirements is and how they should have performed and what the expectation is. And then the stroke coordinator and the nurse both signed off. So when the surveyor pulled that chart and found it, the stroke coordinator said, yes, we I realize this, this is an I met with that nurse. I found out she didn't really understand that she was supposed to do it this way. Here's my documentation that I met with her and sat down, and I followed up with her on other patients 
after that, and she's always performed appropriately since. So they know that it's not a perfect world. What they want to see is that you found the problem, that you addressed it, and then you followed up to make sure that the problem didn't reoccur. What charts are they going to review? Well, they like to do open charts if possible, and somehow when you have a stroke survey, those are the days that you don't seem to have many inpatient strokes in-house. And then the day they leave, you'll admit a couple patients, and that's okay. So you're going to have checked first thing in the morning, so you're going to know what stroke patients are in-house. They're going to want to see at least one patient that had alteplase. They will ask you, do you give alteplase outside the three-hour window? Show me a chart of those that patient. If you are a hospital that may transfer patients to a higher level of care, show me a patient that was transferred to a higher level of care. Um, they'll want to see an ischemic stroke patient who did not receive alteplase, and what they're looking in that is did the physician, usually the ED physician, but it could be the neurologist of their consulted or teleneurology, did they document why they did not give alteplase? Alteplase was considered or thrombolytic therapy was considered and not given because patients on Eliquis. They want to see that the doctor considered that and did not give it because, and they want it stated like that. Um, they'll look at a TIA patient. If you are a primary stroke center and you do keep your intracranial hemorrhages or subarachnoid hemorrhages, they're going to want to look at those charts. Now, if you kept an intracranial hemorrhage because it was going to be a palliative care or a hospice patient, they won't look at that chart. If you do endovascular therapy, even if you're a primary care center, but you have endovascular capability, they're going to want to look at one of those charts. And then if you transfer the patient out for a higher level of care, um, they'll want to see that chart. So some surveyors, if you do not have these patients in-house, will allow you to choose the patient in which they are going to review. So you should have a little cheat sheet that says, okay, in this patient, everything looks good. I've got consent. The patient, the doctor documented an NIH. We have a good documentation of last known well. They did a dysphagia screening. My TPA, sorry, alteplase monitoring form is complete. The blood pressure was always within parameters, or if it was outside the parameters, there's documentation of what they did, so this is a good chart for them to look at. Some surveyors are very detail-oriented. They will go and look at your alteplase monitoring form, and most organizations, I, I think, still use paper because it's a lot easier than documenting the uh, electronic medical record. So they'll look, okay, did they do vital signs every 15 minutes? Did they do it every 30 minutes for six hours? Did they do it? And some will actually look and make sure that the times are correct. Some just look and say, yep, all your blanks are completed. I've had them go blood pressure by blood pressure to make sure it was never out of range. Or if it was out of range, show me what the nurse did. Or I noticed that this NIH went from a 2 to a 5. What did the nurse do about that? So some are very detail-oriented, and they look over that chart with a magnifying glass. Let me look at every single item on it. Others just look and say, oh, yeah, it's complete. If you've had a patient who had a hemorrhagic conversion, then you're going to want to have done an in-depth review. And sometimes it's not that you guys did anything wrong. Some patients, the blood pressure was managed, the glucose was managed. They were appropriately Selected, it just happened. So if you've had that happen, make sure you've done an in-depth review because they'll ask you if you had a hemorrhagic conversion and they'll ask, often ask to see that chart. 
when they get your medical staff, you know for sure they're going to choose your um, stroke medical director. If you do endovascular therapy, they're going to choose that physician. And medical staff, because uh, Joint Commission is, or and DMV look at those charts, they're very good. They, they're going to look at privileges, the, what privileges does that pay, uh, physician have, do we do primary source verification, if they're required to have ACLS, do you have a current ACLS card in the file? So usually medical staff does pretty well. Then they get to human resources, and they're going to pick, and often they'll just, they'll do it one of two ways. They'll pick the names of people as they're doing their tracer. I want that nurse. I want that CT tech. I want that pharmacist. So you know who's going to be working that day. Make sure their files look good. They're going to look at their orientation, especially if they've just been with you for a year or less. And then if they've been with you more, how did you evaluate their competency on an annual basis? What primary source verification of licensures, if they are supposed to have BLS, NIH, ACLS, show me that. An annual evaluation that is assigned by the employee, a job description, and then show me what education that employee has received. And then you get to the end of the day, and it's the exit conference. And pretty much throughout the day, the surveyor will tell you, this is probably going to be a finding if I find it one more time, or this is one time, this is a finding. And So you're pretty aware of where you are. But at the end of the day, they will go through what they found. Joint Commission and DMV is a little different. Joint Commission will tell you exactly what your findings are and what level they are. DMV will tell you what they found, but the level of the findings and the final report usually comes about two weeks after they leave your organization. But they will always give you the standard on which they are citing you against. And this is the standard, and here's what I found. And then they leave. And then it's time to celebrate. Even if you had findings, and honestly, it's very, very rare for a hospital not to have at least one finding because we're not perfect. But celebrate your success. You have good stroke programs, and you want to get better. And that surveyor, I always look at it, they're giving me additional information. They're seeing it from a new set of eyes. The things I've seen every day, they see it differently. So they're giving me valuable information about how I can make my program better. And we'll open it up to questions. Hi, Colleen, it's Tiana. So we do have a question on the Q&A section of WebEx in reference to slide 20 and chart reviews. Okay. If it is a closed chart, how recent should it be within a week, month, quarter of discharge? Usually within a quarter, I would say. Very seldom do they say, I want to see a patient six months ago. Um, so I would pick a couple closed medical records from the last three months that I know are good and be ready to present those. Okay. And again, everyone, if um, you can either unmute your line by pressing star six, or you can go ahead and write your question on the Q&A section of WebEx. Okay, so we have another question. How many findings will lead you to not being certified for a hospital seeking certification for the first time? Are we talking about Joint Commission? Well, let me, so they're more lenient on the first survey because they know you're just starting out. And so the most important things is, are you able to give out to place safely? So are you giving it at least 50% of the time within that 60 minute window? Are you screening the patient so the doctor's documentation 
it's good. It shows why we're giving out to place or it says we're not because of X. Are they monitoring the patients by protocol? Every 15 minutes for two hours, every 30 minutes for six, every hour for the next 16. Did we manage the patient's blood pressure? Did we do a dysphagia screening? So they want you to have the basic components of the program. They know that, and you know, for Joint Commission for Primary, you only have to have four months of data. So they know that you're just starting out. So if you're doing the, if you're able to give out to place within 60 minutes, 50% of the time, and you're, it's done safely and you're monitoring the patient carefully, you've started, you have a stroke medical director, you have your stroke team, most likely you're going to pass. Okay, so we have another question. We are going for Joint Commission Comprehensive. Do they cite you if your door to groin puncture times are too long? What should the time be? Well, there really isn't standards. The recommendation right now is 90 minutes. But, you know, when Comprehensive Stroke first started, and it's only been six years because the first hospitals were certified in 2012, in the fall. So, and it was really looking at aneurysms. You had to have 20 aneurysms. You had to have so many corallines. And so it's only the mechanical thrombectomies that's really come to the forefront in the last couple of years. So they haven't established time frames, but most are trying to do it within 90 minutes, and that's hard. So what I would suggest is you figure out what your door to groin puncture is right now, and then what can you do to improve it? Can we do our CT, give, start the ultra place in the scanner, and then immediately do our CTA? So you're saving some time there. How do we expedite getting the team in? What is the expectation of at 2 in the morning for that team to get back to the hospital? So start looking at pull your whole team together and go step by step. What does it take to get that patient to the lab and groin puncture? And where can we shave off five minutes here and a minute here and ten minutes here? And just gradually be showing that you're getting the time shorter and shorter till they publish what their expectations are. Any other questions? Uh, Again, if anyone wants to ask any other questions, oh, we just had one pop in. Okay, so I know that evidence-based practices support no folly if possible. My neurologist wants all patients that receive TBA to have a folly. I am new to my position. We are just now putting a policy into place. Thoughts? Yes, yeah, so a lot of, so the Foley catheters, when we first started giving out to place years ago, we were very stringent. Everybody had a Foley. Everybody had strict bed rest for the first 24 hours. You didn't even do an IV stick or a blood draw if at all possible could be avoided. And now we're becoming a little bit, more relaxed and realizing that the half-life of Alta Place is very short. So if it's your neurologist, you might want to do a lit review to show him that maybe we don't need to put a Foley in everybody, and maybe you could start criteria. In one hospital I saw, they only put a Foley in if the Very NIH quickly. was greater than six. So if it was a a patient whose NIH was less than six, they didn't put a Foley in. So gradually, just have honest conversations with him. Mm -hmm. 
So again, if you have any questions, you can either type them in on the Q&A section or you can press star six to unmute. Well, while we're waiting for another question, the other thing I would ask the physician is, why do you feel everybody needs a Foley? Is he worried that if they don't have the Foley, they're going to get up and fall? So try to understand from his standpoint why he's so insistent that everybody have a Foley. And then you can address his concerns. All right. Um, well, since there are no other questions, I would like to um, remind everyone uh, that, we, that you'll be able to claim your CME, CE credits at the end of the 15-week series on September 27th, and a copy of today's slides and any handouts will be sent to you within a week of today's call. Um, so just one more time, if there are any questions, you can star six to unmute or write it into the Q&A section. And so we do not seem to have any other questions. Colleen, thank you so much for Should a great I presentation. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, will this presentation with the audio be available? My understanding was that it would be, but if Larissa by any chance or Audrey Bell is on the line that can um, verify just to make sure. I know that the handouts are uh, sent to you within a week's time. I, was, I thought that they were sent in, uh, in addition with the recording. I know we do hey, have Deanna? the recording. Yes. The recordings will be available via YouTube um, usually within a week or two. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for participating and going. Again, thank you so much for a great presentation. Uh, we will, uh, like we stated, we will send this uh, within a week's time to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.